All right. Next position. We'll get started in this a little bit before we take a break. Um, first of all, with position, it is really key to get your current limit set because you are not spinning something. You are running something a given distance, and it eventually is going to hit something or be out of range. And in the beginning, somebody's going to screw up and not stop it, and you need to have the current limit set so that crazy things don't happen. So I'm going to go zero this thing out. Uh, we're actually going to go work with Talon. I'm setting my current limit at 10. Is this actually a 90-15 or a 5-50? Um, this is, what is this? Gosh, long shaft or? This is actually a 5-50, which is really close to a 90-15. Alrighty. Okay, so position. We're done getting up to a speed. Now it's about putting that mark in the right place as fast as we can. So, first of all, let's see back. And. I am going to zero my encoder. One of the things you can do is you can go in here and say, Talon, on the incremental encoder, which has been counting, zero that. Wherever you're at, just zero it. Or I can also write a specific value to it. And I'm just going to tell it to zero it. I'm just going to call that point zero. Okay, and so now let's see if I fire this back up, go back over here, and... Okay, so when I look, my incremental encoder, I have zero. My absolute encoder, I can't zero. It's absolute. It's telling me wherever it's at. And right now, from zero to 4096, it is sitting at 1690. 1690 happens to be my spot straight up. So if I wanted, when I fire this up, I could say, OK, I want you to run that thing to wherever the absolute encoder is 1690 and then zero the incremental encoder and now zero is zero. Or literally I could say, okay, I know I'm this far off of center. I could simply write the correct value into the incremental encoder and say I'm done. When I tell the incremental encoder to go to zero, it's going to end up at zero. So you can manipulate all this stuff to end up sorting out what your zero is going to be. But in position, Somehow you have to get this thing referenced. Where, where am I starting? Where am I going? How do I actually have values that correlate to physical things moving? Here, we want to be able to move this from 0 to 360 degrees. Think of this as azimuth control. And this pulley is one to one with the azimuth on that thing. And I want to be able to tell that wheel to point some direction, 360 degrees. So let's figure out how we do that. I think I have everything zeroed. And let's make sure position that's all zero. That's good. That's good. That's all good. The current limit's good. All right. So five. All right, right now, my position is zero, it's sitting at minus one. And I want to get that to go to 1,000. So I've got 4096, or roughly 4,000, is all the way around. 1,000 is 90 degrees. So I want that thing to go from straight up to 90 degrees to right over here. So that's a show when I do that. All right, so I'm going to tell it go to a thousand. 
and we'll see what happens. And so there's a thousand. My set point goes to a thousand, and absolutely nothing happened. Why? There's no values in anything. Same as before, nothing's going to happen. Now, on position, when position is done, I'm supposed to go from this point to this point. When position is done, how much energy am I putting into the motor? None. We're done. We're sitting still. This isn't exactly true if you're taking a truck up a mountainside, but normally here, position, I'm here, I got to put energy in to move the mechanism, and then I finally get to where I'm going and I stop. What happens if we use F? F is my command time some value. Okay, so I'm sitting here at zero. Let's say I use some F. I put in a thousand. I want to go to a thousand. Okay, a thousand is air times F, blah, blah, blah. F doesn't care about the air. F is simply going straight into the output. I'm headed to my goal. Here's my goal. Great. F says, I don't care. I'm driving you at this speed all the time, and I don't ever plan to stop because you're at a velocity. Turns out you don't use F in position because there's not some bare minimum. If you had a truck headed up the side of a mountain, that at all times gravity is trying to pull that truck down a mountain, you might use some F to say, okay, there's X amount of force even to hold that truck still. But for us, for the most part, we don't. So we're not going to use any F in position. So we're just going to skip that part. So we go straight to P. Now P should work. I'm at zero. I need to be at a thousand. I have an error of a thousand. I put some P in. I'm going to get an output, and as I get closer to my answer, my error is going to get less, P is going to get less, cool, it'll eventually all stop. Hopefully at a thousand. Let's find out. And Okay, we'll cut to the chase. I asked you what P should be, you all guessed wrong, I have fun at your expense, and we eventually end up at point two. Why point two? I've been doing this a long time, it's an okay place to start, and this whole thing is scripted, so it goes kind of good. With experience, you would get there too. All right, I'm about to hit enter. Let's watch my velocity and watch my position. All right, here's a P of point two. Okay, cool. My encoder position, which is this purple line, wasn't zero. I wanted to get to a thousand. Actually, what scale is that? Um, that's on the yellow one. Oh, yes. So my purple one, I'm trying to get it to a thousand. I'm at zero. Then I made it to about 800. Actually, 814. And then it stopped. And when it stopped, I'm still sitting at a half a volt onto my gearbox. So I have an error of 200. 200 times 0.2 is some output. And indeed, I see some output. But as it turns out, when you look at all the drag in this gear train, as I got closer to my position and my output kept going down, Turns out all the friction, this thing stopped when it was still outputting half a volt because a half a volt won't turn all the inertia and drag in this thing. So once again, P is not high enough to drive me to my complete answer. As I got closer and it kept turning P down pretty quick, it couldn't even overcome the friction of this system to get to the right answer. And shocker, we'll fix that with I. All right. But looks stable, we can probably take P up a little bit higher. And so let's go crazy. Let me light this back up. And I'm going to take P up to 
The sequence would have been 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 to 1 to 4. We're going to go straight to 4. Let's see what happens. Now, I would expect with much bigger P, I'm going to have more amplification on that error. I would expect to get closer to my answer before it runs out of oomph. By the time it gets to a half a volt, though, it's probably not going to turn this anymore. So let's put 4 in for P. And poof. Okay. Interesting thing happened on the way to the answer. Good news is, I'm pretty close to where I'm supposed to be. That was enough to drive it plus or minus one of a thousand. So at a P of four, I got pretty close to my answer. But I also have an oscillation net. And while it's stable, it did eventually settle, and it settled pretty close to the answer. It was, P's really hot, get there, get there, get there, oh, you're going too fast, too fast, too fast, and it finally settles. Now, I look and say, hmm, this might be a job for D. Because I really like the fact it drove my air down quite a bit, but it just overshot. It's like it was getting there too fast. So, um, actually the next thing I would do is say, let's go really crazy and put in 8. And so here's 8. You actually won't see much happen up here because we're actually pretty close. If I try to fight that, it'll fight me back and put it there. But, let's see, so now we're Oops. Okay, let's go back and do some motion. Five, all right, so I'm sitting at 1,000. Let's go back to 500. Okay, good news is, boy, with P of 8, my error is 0. I got enough P to drive me right to my answer eventually. There's a big party that happens along the way because this thing oscillates like crazy. But I really like P that high because I have acceptable error. I wonder if I can put some D in this and slow that thing down so it doesn't overshoot, but still leave all that P in there to drive me to the right answer. Because then I wouldn't have to mess with I, and I get rid of all of this instability question. So, let's try some D. Uh, Jared? Yes? When you had a study for speed, you said, well, you said dial up the P until you saw like maybe one ring. Yeah. For this one, you dial it up until. It, it really, it's. Eventually, if I kept dialing this up, it would oscillate. Okay. And so if you went that far and actually it would oscillate it, I didn't take it that far. We're not far away from that. Okay. That was a, probably by the time you're at 16, this thing never shuts up. And really bad things happen really fast when you oscillate a gearbox, so we probably won't do that. But if I went there and cut it in half, I'd be back at eight, which is where I'm at now. So this, this one, the rules are a little softer. A little softer. And, and once again, these are all just general guidelines to get you in the ballpark. Um, your mileage is going to vary a little bit. Um, and part of it is, I would never leave it like this, but I'm about to try a little something that might help this. Because I like the fact that it drove my error to zero. Because it means I might be able to avoid using I, I just got a ringing problem. So to your point, I could never leave it like this. And if I went until it oscillated and cut it in half, I'd probably end up pretty close to a happy place. But we're going to try some trickery. We're going to say, I don't need I. I've got enough air. If I can fix this overshoot, sounds like a job for D. Let's see what happens. So where we want to configure that. And closed loop tuning. And D. And once again, general starting place for D is 10x of P. What's P right now? 8. Let's try 8. We'll see what happens. So only difference between what you just saw and what I put in here is we put a bunch of D in. And we're at 500 and we're going to go to... 
15. Okay. Oh, and magic happened. Where did it go? You shut her off pretty quick. No, I was looking for the previous one. There it is. Okay. There was the previous one, step change, look at the red, look at how much that thing was ringing. And over here, I put a bunch of D in it, not perfect, but shockingly better. Hmm. And a little seemed to be good. What do we do next? A lot more. So, we're going to go back, and if... Uh, 80 was good. Let's double it. Let's put in 160. My, when you look, the um, yeah, it's kind of hard to see here. It's all jumbled together. We'll expand this a little bit. My purple is the encoder I'm driving. I told it to go to 500. I want it to get to 500. And so I was sitting over here at 1500. Right here's my purple. And I tell it to go. My speed speeds up. I'm headed towards the right answer. I'm getting close to the right answer. And boy, it lands it pretty perfectly. My velocity goes back to zero. There's no overshoot. This is really looking pretty nice and pretty snappy as far as position control. So that was 160. I wonder, this is pretty good, can I take P up now? I fixed my instability problem. Can I take P up some more? Maybe. Let's go see. And let's see. We did have P at 8, and if we were going to tweak that up a little bit, let's double. All right. Because by cranking P up, I'm going to get more accuracy on my answer, and I'm going to get there quicker. So let's see what happens. Let's see what I'm going to slow this down. Good. Hmm. Pretty nimble. Pretty accurate. Just a little bit of overshoot. See, my position is my purple line. I overshot a little bit, but then it got happy. And I don't have any big violent oscillation here. And how did we fix a little overshoot last time? More D. D. And a little was good, so let's do more. And what you're seeing here is a case where this is a stair-step process. I took P to a limit. I stabilized it with some D. I can take P higher. I'll stabilize that with some more D. You will eventually get to the point where things explode, so there is a limit. And Jerry, could you be running into current limit also? Um, I am absolutely running into the current limit when we start. So yeah, you are seeing this run into the current limit. So. And that can also affect things, right? And it will. The reason that I'm still dialing P, if I was going to use this for asthma, this thing is on the floor, and it has more drag than it has right here. I like a lot of oomph trying to guarantee this thing gets to the right position. So I'd like to take P up as high as I can get it before I have instability problems. And the good news is 
When I add that to the robot and I'm turning my wheels and all those belts and stuff, and it's on the ground with the drag of the ground, it's actually going to help stabilize this. So the worst case scenario is right here. If it's stable here, it will actually be more stable on the ground because I've added all that drag. So we're going to go take some more. Uh, quick request, uh, can you uh, have your graph running while you try to turn the motor by hand? Yep. So right here, we're sitting at 1500. And now you will see, as I start to back that away, see my voltage coming up? I'm at 1501, 97. Jesus. At eight tenths of a volt, that motor is pushing hard enough on that 100 to 1 gear train, you're going nowhere. So if I put a breaker bar on this, I could maybe move it five counts. Five counts is about three tenths of a degree. So that azimuth is locked to three tenths of a degree, with or without you having a breaker bar trying to take it the other direction. So getting pretty happy about this, I maybe not need any integrator here. It'll snap to the right place, do it in a hurry, not going to move any place. So I'll show you one more thing, then we'll take a break. If you didn't have so much gear reduction there, is there a chance you would need the integrator then? Potentially. Okay. Um, and honestly, we have been dialing around for the last couple of years. In an asthma, what you want is the wheel to go the direction you want it to go instantly and stay there. And as it turns out, it doesn't take an enormous amount of force to hold it there. Turns out one of the bigger challenges in asthma is as you spin up your drivetrain, that rotor is spinning at a zillion RPM. The single biggest problem with getting that thing to stop on a dime is getting the rotor stopped. And so you can actually overpower your asthma drive and get in really big trouble. You do not want to overpower that, and you don't want to speed it up any faster than possible. That robot has 71, 70 to 1 ratios on the asthma. Um, we went too far. This year's robot will have 100 to 1. Um, it's not a huge change, but we've slowly been dialing in on the right answer. Um, we were trying to slow down rotor speed, so the rotor didn't have to spin up as fast to move the asthma, and it's a lot easier to stop. You also lose gear ratio and some other things. And 100 to 1 is probably a pretty good answer. All right, so one quick thing, I'm going to take a break. And that's key with like position controls. There's uh, another team that thought, well, thinks he really needed lots of power on his azimuth. And it doesn't have to be azimuth, it can be an arm, right? And put a, a 775 there. Could not get it stable. Um, and it was all based on uh, rotor inertia, because you think, hey, it's a big, powerful motor. You should be able to do anything. Yeah, they had a 775 on a 300 to 1 ratio. And then, a, you could pull a Honda across the playing field. It wouldn't do that. <laughs> but you didn't need anywhere near that much horsepower and that much gear ratio to do that. And the problem they had, you had to spin the thing clear up to get the wheels to get to the right place, and by the time you got to the right place, I have a 775 rotor going full tilt. You are not stopping that thing in a hurry. Way too much motor, way too much gear train. All right, and one, and three, and So there, uh, while he's doing that, their solution was to put a voltage limit in the talon, which in a sense makes the motor look like a smaller motor because it moves that whole torque speed curve down. So it ended up looking like a bag motor by when they were done from a okay. power output. So I just took my D to 320, and we're about to do something based on what Mark just said of limiting our voltage. Okay, so now we're running. Let's go to a position of 500. Actually, that's pretty snappy, pretty good. I see a little oscillation in my voltage, but actually my position is pretty happy. Don't see much oscillation there. And so we'll let this run.
And so if you actually watch the screen and see that dot, you just see that thing snapping back and forth. And when I put some drag on it like there will be on the floor, you're going to see that oscillation go away. It gets a lot happier as you add drag into it. So this would be a case where we've got this pretty tuned up, and I'd say on a bench, all right, we're plenty good. Put it on the robot, put it on the floor, get all the wheels, everything in the drag, and do your final tuning there. To Mark's point, we actually might not want to spin that rotor up all the way. In essence, it's kind of a poor man's motion magic where we're going to say, on your way to the right answer, don't go clear to 12 volts. We're going to clamp this thing at 6 volts and see what that does. So we'll configure that. Three, let's say peak output is 6 volts. And so here's 500. Oh, that's nicer. Cool. So, as it turns out, clamping that thing at 6 volts and saying, okay, I'm going to accelerate up heading to my direction. But I'm just not going to let you get past 6 volts. You're going to hold right here, and then we'll get you slowed down. <coughs> Turns out that doesn't cost me a lot in time getting there. And I solved the whole problem of I'm going way too fast when I want to slow down. And that's actually a way to also tune these as you simply clamp your maximum speed. So to optimize that, we actually clamp the motor. And that's a 550 in here. When you're clamping a 550, you sure don't need more motor. So a 775 and a 300 to 1 gear ratio, you're just asking for trouble. So another technique you can use. So here you have then a position control, and this very same approach would work. Whether it's rotating asthma, I have a rack and pinion and a gear and a string pot, all the same. I want to move something from point A to point B, and as I approach point B, I want to stop. I want to get there quick but I want to stop and not overshoot and not ring, and I want it so there's some force holding it. When I'm in the right place, I can reef on this thing and it's not going anywhere. And so up here, if I look, I was at my 1500, zoom right down here to my 500, that settles in nicely. I see some current accelerating the motor. I see some more current slowing the motor down and my velocity doesn't overshoot either. Everything looks pretty nice. Yeah, the voltage is a little bit of a party. Remember me talking about D is noise sensitive? How big is D? 320. This thing will be wildly noise sensitive. And so any noise coming off of the position, and there is some where it's not quite stable in what position it is, is going to make D rattle my output voltage. But as it turns out, okay, I'm pretty happy with what else goes on. The velocity looks good. Everything's working like it should. Those events are very fast. The motor, in essence, doesn't see them. It's not pretty, but I don't care. And so at the end of the day, I have asthma control that is simply a PD. And with no eye, I get plenty of accuracy. I don't have wind-up problems. I don't have the fact that I takes a long time to drive me to the final answer. This thing snaps to the right answer. And I got there by cranking P up a lot, saying, hmm, I wonder if I can stabilize that with some D. I did. I took P even farther, stabilized that with some D. And my air, and there's still air. With P, you're going to have some air. It's less than three-tenths of a degree on asthma. I don't care. And this is nice and stable, and you'll never have a problem with it. Yes? Is there any concern on the, the voltage switching circuitry? For the most part, no. Um, they've got the, the drive block, and this is pretty robust. And quite frankly, what's going on there is way, way, way slower than the chop that's actually going on. That is the output voltage it thinks it's doing, keeping in mind that voltage simply equals the duty cycle. That thing's chopping at 15 kilohertz the whole time. So that is a position loop. 
Any questions on position loops? Okay. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll talk a little bit about motion magic and anything on the robot you guys want to talk about. We got one last thing we'll cover. So that is almost the last slide. Um, and then we're done with probably a little bit of time here. We'll try to wrap up in 20 minutes or so. And then you guys can ask us whatever you want about any of this, about the robot. And we will share everything we can uh, that we actually know how it works on that robot and uh, answer any questions. So the last thing we'll talk about is this motion magic. And it's actually pretty cool and very usable. We just got done going through a position loop. We said, okay, I'm going to use P. Turns out I can get P high enough with the help of I, or with the help of D. I didn't need I. I could have used I. I is just, it settles slowly, and I really like snapping my asthma to the right place. So the PD thing works pretty good. Um, but what's going on is when that loop says, hey, you're in the wrong place. I have air. Go to the right place. It is simply talking to the motor in terms of voltage. It's telling the motor, you need to go from here to there, and this many volts go. I really don't have a clue how fast you're going. I'm just going to give you this many volts until I get close, and P starts to slow me down, and I settle in. Well, G, if I had a velocity loop, I had this thing all set up where I could say, go this fast, and it went that fast, like we tuned before. And then I had a position loop sitting on top of that, where the position loop, instead of telling the motor, run this many volts, is actually telling another control loop, go this fast. The difference is, if I'm just telling the motor voltage, it'll maybe head the right direction, but you don't know for sure how fast you do not have exact control of how fast that thing is heading towards the goal because you're outputting voltage open loop. You kind of know, but not exactly. So if I put a velocity system between that command and the motor, I could wrap my motor in a velocity loop and have my position loop tell the velocity loop, you're not in the right place, you need to go that direction, and you need to go this exact speed, and you have a closed loop. Go that speed no matter what as you approach the answer. As you get close to the answer, now go this speed, now go that speed, now go that speed. And it's a much more precise way to guarantee my motion profile, the acceleration, the movement, and the slowing down, boy, you're in control now. Because you're not wondering what speed is it actually going. I have a separate velocity loop that's going to make it go the speed I want. And my position loop is telling my velocity loop, run this speed until I say otherwise. OK, now run that speed. And when you look at the motion control stuff that um, uh, Cross the Road did, in essence, you would build that profile in an Excel spreadsheet that I want to go from this point to that point, and at all these moments, this is the velocity I need to be running. And the robo wheel would puke that data stream out to the town, and it would do that. And a lot of things had to go right, and it was pretty complicated, and Java was a problem, and so on and so forth. Then very, very few people actually used that. Very powerful, but very complicated. So what they did in Motion Magic, and you know, interesting name, first they had Motion Profiling, now there's Motion Magic, because the talent does all the hard work for you. You no longer need to do anything ahead of time, but inside the talent, they don't really have the ability to do two control loops, where there's a velocity loop and a position loop. So what they did is they said, okay, we're going to cheat a little bit. We'll do a position loop. Our velocity loop is only going to use F. It actually isn't a complete closed loop, but I actually get to map it so I have another layer of control to where my velocity is actually proportionally scaled in a way that makes sense. I figure out what full speed is. I use F to roughly get that right. 
As you recall, with F, we got pretty close, where I tell it to go a speed and it would go about that speed. Well, in motion magic, you actually do that same exercise. You use F to make a velocity loop. It's pretty close. And then the position loop talks to the velocity loop about what to do. But the velocity loop is only just F. It's not a full PID. So it's not perfect, but it's close enough and pretty cool. And so you have your position loop plus two other values. You tell the talon, OK, when you're sitting here and I'm going to take off that direction, this is the rate of acceleration. This is how quickly I want you to speed up as you're heading the right direction. I also am going to tell you, this is your cruise control rate. When you get to this speed, you may have more voltage, don't use it. You're going to go this speed until you get close to your answer, and then you are going to slow down at the rate I told you as you approach your answer. And so this is a very clever way to get almost a full motion control thing inside of the talon, where you don't have to do any of this spreadsheet stuff and feed it a bunch of data. So what it really is, it's a position loop with an F-only based velocity loop, and you are adding an acceleration parameter and a cruise parameter to get you where you want to go. So what I'm going to do, you just watch me tune this azimuth with a position loop using P and D. And at the end of the day, I actually slowed down my cruise by simply clamping the voltage. I clamped it at 6 volts, so even if P wanted to drive me to 12, it can only get to, to 6. But I've still got my full P to drive my answer really steep slope getting to my final position. Well, we're going to go fire up motion magic here, which is going to achieve almost the same thing. Except now I can tell motion magic, I want you to cruise at this velocity. But if something gets in the way of this wheel, and for whatever reason you can't go the right speed, you can go all the way to 12 volts to, to get there. Um, I'm not clamping the voltage. So now I've opened the door where if something goofy happens and a wheel can't turn, I do have the full horsepower of the motor to do it with everything still under control. So motion magic is simply a position loop where instead of driving the voltage, I'm putting an F factor in there to scale that really into the right units. And then I can tell it, this is my slope, this is my cruise, and this is how I finish. So let's go do that. And Jeff was kind enough to make this bigger so you guys can now read it. Um, as it turns out, the P and D values are close. We could go through about two hours and you'd see why, but I'm just going to punch in where you would end up if I were to uh, do that. Actually, we're going to do one thing first. First thing you have to do is figure out what F would be, because you now need F in this. Remember before I said you never use F in position. Well, we aren't using any F in our position loop. We're using F to kind of make a velocity loop that runs underneath of that. So I have my asthma thing here. And what I have got to do is figure out what my F is. And I'm actually going to cheat. I'm going to go to a velocity mode and try to get that right. Um, So you're going to put that azimuth into a, as though it's a spinning wheel. Correct. Into a spinning wheel and figure out roughly what does my F need to be. So when I tell it to go a particular speed, it goes about that speed. Kind of a, a pretend velocity loop. All right, we get everything zeroed out here. Get my voltages cranked back up. Jay, I don't know what velocity you should target for this type of application. Um, what you want to do for motion magic is figure out what is max speed 
and make sure this thing is scaled so the position loop, when it thinks it wants to go a particular speed, it kind of goes that speed. And then you later tell it in the, in the cruise rate how fast you want to go. And that's a determination of basically how spun up do you want to be as you approach your answer. And that will become more obvious in a minute. I'll show you in the live demo. All right, I'm so zero. Back and five. Let's put in eight hundred. Okay, I told it I want to go eight hundred is my speed, and oh, because that's not running. Okay. 800 is my speed. Of course, nothing's happening because I have no values in there. So let's go configure this. And F. So let's see. And actually, I don't have a cheat sheet. So I don't know. Uh, let's start out at 0.5. Cool, it runs. You will also notice, see the light blue line? That's my absolute encoder. And so every time you see that thing snap down, it's crossing zero and going around again. So every one of those is a full revolution of the motor. All right, I told it that, oh, 800. I put a particular F in there. It's only going 540. Probably not enough F. So let's put some more in there. Let's try point seven five. Not too bad. I told it to go eight hundred. It's going about eight hundred. Four hundred is pretty close. Two hundred is pretty close. Thousand is pretty close. So it's not exact, but I tell it to go a particular speed, and just with that, it's pretty close to that speed. Now, what I am missing is any active feedback on the velocity. This was really a scaling exercise. But quite frankly, with a 100 to 1 gear train, the, what's down here is almost invisible to the motor. Most of that motor's problem is simply getting everything spinning. With a 100 to 1 gear train, indeed this thing would lift the Honda out here. And you grab this and the motor doesn't even know it. So this is pretty effective now to where my position loop can tell the velocity loop, which is just feed forward, what speed to go as I'm headed towards my right position. So my F for motion magic is about 0.75. In the Talon manual, they will give you a bunch of math to go through. At the end of the day, you just want the value that lets the command make it go the right speed. And this is the best way to figure out what F is for motion magic. So let's go put it back in motion magic mode. Ah, uh, and you'll notice over here in my cheat sheet, which actually I can probably make a picture. For my motion magic setup, my P, I actually know it's 13, and my D is 175, and my F is 0.75. We could go through the tuning exercise, and what we're going to find out is 13 and 175. 13 is about all the higher I get. 70, 175 is the D that stabilizes it. And it's a little bit different because it's not talking voltage anymore. It's actually telling this thing what speed to go with the feed forward loop we just did. So let me punch those in. 
accelerate and then I'm going to show you what they do. My incremental encoder was zeroed in a particular place, but it wasn't where my mark was straight up. And so I could do the map and say, well, it's about at some degrees. My incremental encoder says this. I know what straight up was on my incremental encoder. I know how far off that is. I could just write that into the absolute or into the incremental value. And since I told it to be at zero, I just told it someplace else, and that thing's going to zero, and now zero is straight up. Instead, I'm just going to incrementally bump it and get it in the right place. So I'm forcing 500 into the encoder position. Because I it's told to go to zero, as soon as there's 500 in there, it's I'm 500 off, I'm going to zero. And so I'm incrementally walking this thing around. in, I want it to go that far, and it just, it's, uh, the, the incremental encoder just keeps going. The absolute goes around and goes back to zero. All right. And yes, Jeff, what I said is not exactly correct, but at this time of the day, the rest of that discussion would blow, uh, blow the discussion up in the room, so. All right, and so that is set. We're going to call that straight up. So now, indeed, zero is straight up. And so we go back to this. So let's say I want to go to 1,000, which is roughly for, uh, 90 degrees. There we go. And back. Thousand is over. Let's go all the way around. Let's go to 4,100, which be almost all the way back to zero. Now, if you set the acceleration down to a low number, it would kind of ease up to speed, get around and post down slow? Yes. So, what we see here, and I still don't have something set right because that thing's a little bit unstable, but okay for now. In Motion Magic, it said, hey, time to go. I need to get from zero to, what the heck's the other one? Yellow scale. Oh, that's velocity, all right. So, where is my encoder position that is purple and that's against that one? Ah, so I was just up here at 4,000 and I wanted to go back to zero. It's tricky because we're going to the limit. So I was at 4,000 all the way around and I wanted to go all the way around back to zero. So what has to happen? 
Well, I got to take my velocity as something other than zero. But you'll notice, see my cruise right here? It's about at 400. I told it cruise at 400. I told it a particular acceleration rate, which is really that slow. If I change that rate, that slope changes. So literally now, the process of getting to my new answer, I can control how fast I go, and I can control the slope of those. Let's go change this to 800 and see what happens. Does the slope typically mirror on both sides? Yes, you get one number and the slope is the same on both sides. And I hope that works for you because you've got no other choice. You get one number and it's the acceleration rate. All right. And so we're going to change our cruise velocity from 400 to 800. Now, what the tailwind is doing is saying, okay, he gave me an F factor. I know roughly how to get to 800. I'm just going to do a different voltage that's roughly 800. And we're at zero, so let's actually, we're going to go to 4,000 so this thing doesn't go. Tell you, I something is not zeroed right because this thing's a little bit unstable doing it. And rather than going to find it, just trust me. If I figured out whatever I didn't have right, this would work better. But now I told it 800. I see it go to 800, but it's a little bit unstable. I actually overshoot a little bit. It finally gets settled at 800 as I'm cruising. Oh, but I'm almost there, and now I've got to slow down. But indeed, I see my purple take off, head to 4,000, and get there, and it's all pretty stable ending. So if I figured out whatever I didn't have programmed right, that would look a lot more textbook perfect. But I see my current ramp up, and it's a little bit goofy. Normally, you see it ramp up and be pretty flat and ramp up to finish. But Even if that was perfect, Jerry, your plateau would not be very wide, though. <coughs> Correct, the plateau would not be very wide because it took a while to get up there. I'm going really fast. I get there in a hurry and I got to slow down again. So literally, as you make your, your plateau higher, this can start to look like just a mountain because about the time I get there, I got to slow down. As I slow that down a lot, you'll get a much bigger plateau. You could achieve a lot of this with a position loop by clamping the voltage but this actually has a few advantages because it does a few more things for you on the motion profiler. Um, in the past, we have put full-blown velocity loops inside the Talon and a full-blown position loop inside of the Robo Rio to where the Robo Rio is worried about that position loop telling the Talon how fast to go and the Robo Rio is watching the position of what you're doing. But we actually did on the, uh, the garbage cans of those arms that picked that thing up. That was such a dynamic mess that we needed a full velocity loop doing that. So that velocity was constant no matter what went on. Can, no can, straight up, straight down. And then the Robo Rio took care of the position loop. We've actually done that quite a bit. There are several cases of that on that robot where there's velocity loops running on the talons and position loops, loops running in the Robo Rio. So that is motion magic. It is basically position control where you put a pretend velocity loop in there just using F. You don't get a full PID. So that's motion magic. Any questions on that? Okay. And those are all things we would have set. I limit F, cruise acceleration, P, we didn't actually set I and I zone, but D and if I got to a case a little bit on nominal error, if I'm trying to get to a position, and we have resolution on our azimuths to where I have a tenth of a degree of resolution on what direction that wheel is pointed. If I'm three tenths, I'm good. I don't care. And so I could tell the thing, OK, anything plus or minus three ticks, I'm good. Call it done. 
Do not sit there and oscillate about the answer trying to get to zero. If I get inside of this window, if I'm inside of three tenths of a degree, turn it off and leave it there until I'm outside of it and then drive it back in. You can create a much bigger landing spot and that can help you with loop tuning versus trying to balance something on a pinhead. Is that a feature only of Motion Magic or a... No, no, that's there all the time. Any of the closed loops you can say, this is my acceptable error. And basically, if you go clear back here, oh, let's see. Oh, there we go. Basically, that thing sits right here, and if my error is inside of the window, it shuts that off. And so it stops this whole thing from running if I'm inside of my window. Now, you have to think through your loops and everything of what you're doing of if that's good or bad, but that functionality is there. We will use that on occasion. If you've got some real high resolution encoder and you're trying to drive to zero and it's sitting there and jittering, we have a little bit of a problem on the asthma. Um, I will end up doing that and give it a bigger landing spot. It's no different than an encoder with less counts, and I'm saying, okay, zero is good. Well, here, I've got 10 counts in the space of zero. Anywhere in there is close enough.